Hello and welcome to Brian Moore's Full Contact with The Telegraph. Just one week into the 2021 Six Nations and what price would you have got for three away sides winning, including Scotland hammering England for the first time in 38 years at Twickenham? Gregor's Townsend side, they were better in every department. England can have no complaints and the focus for Scotland now switches to Wales at Murrayfield this weekend as they look to stake their claim as title contenders. Well, England head coach Eddie Jones admitted afterwards he was to blame for the lacklustre performance. We'll go into that in depth fairly shortly and say as a result, we'll live with the squad for a long time and so it should. Ireland opened their campaign with a loss away to Wales. Didn't help that Peter O'Mahony got sent off uh, fairly quickly. Sessions of the Irish supporters were questioning the head coach who was at a mixed year in charge. That's Andy Farrell. And we'll speak to the former Ireland back rower Alan Quinlan to discuss whether he thinks progress is being made. Elsewhere, there was a routine win for France, who are now heavy favourites to win the competition, but they do have to come to Twickenham. And promise you, England will not be as bad as they were against Scotland. Um, and if they are, they'll be really, really in trouble. Uh, we'll assess their performance, discuss what to do with Italy, who registered their 28th consecutive loss in the Six Nations. And as ever, we'll answer your questions regarding the opening round and the new format for the Women's Six Nations. Former England Sevens captain Rob Vickery is here. Hi, Rob. Hi, Brian. You all right? So let's start uh, at Twickenham. Well, beaten in every department. Was there any more, any department which was more impressive than others with Scotland? Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I know I'm a bit of a nerd, so I looked through all the stats. The narrative was really building throughout. I must also say that I am not old enough to ever have seen Scotland win at Twickenham uh, in 83, <laughs> the last one. So it's slightly daunting. I was there two years ago for that mental game, but I think, you know, there's a lot made in the media at the moment about what England have got wrong and how they're going to reconcile and reconsider what's happening. But ultimately, I think that was probably the best Scottish performance I've ever seen by a long way. And, and we have to really give them credit for it because in every single aspect of the game, as you mentioned, they dominated. And the stats also back that up completely. Yeah, and... If you want to be picky, and, and Gregor Townsend and the Scotland squad should and probably will be, uh, they left a lot of points um, not off the board, didn't they? You know, kicks at goal missed, try opportunities missed. I believe they can progress as a squad. They can even get better. But that aspect of their game has to be much more consistent because England didn't deserve to be within, uh, I would say, 12, 15 points of them. Yeah, and is, yeah. yet, a breakaway try at the end could have seen them snatch an, an undeserved victory. Well, I say undeserved, that's the way sport goes, isn't it? Yeah, people were calling that one. Uh, George Ford coming in to try and steer the ship last five minutes. That would have been a travesty of the highest order if England did somehow win that game. Well, it's going to be difficult I, if we first act to come on is to kick the ball again away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll not get you started on the kicking but uh, I think the, the one stat that jumps out and I, I know I'll drip feed these in because they, they do have relevance and context is the most important thing to the stats but Ben Youngs he had 18 passes in mm -hmm. the game Yep, 18 passes I mean that is staggering that a man can be on a scrum half for 53 minutes of the game he was on 54 until Robson came on Robson got 29 he got mm -hmm. more passes than him so mm -hmm. I think in terms of the mindset that's the thing that's really hit hard with the fans and I know the fans get on the back of England at the best of times, but that lacklustre element to it, and you know what it's like because you've played these games. Tell you what, uh, tell you what let's just finish off with Scotland. Yeah. Um, looking, looking ahead for them, one-off, I suppose we'll see because Wales will be a decent challenge at home, though. So title contenders, you've, you've, got, to, you've got to say, at the, well, obviously at the moment, they're, uh, they're still there, they're, they're unbeaten. It is the first game, but as I said, I think they can improve. Yep, and the first time they've won the first game in the Six Nations since it started at Six Nations. Yes. So I think Gregor Towns has been chatting in that. You look at the Six Nations, how it works, and you're always looking for those away fixtures as the big, the big games, the big the big clashes. And for Scotland to have come down to have beaten England, we've got to say at a level playing field, that, that is so significant that there is no crowd, there is no atmosphere, no hostility. Yep. That counts. But England being the first game for them is amazing. Now they've got the momentum. They've got potentially their next hardest game, which will be the Welsh for them and then finish the 28th of Feb after the follow week in this February period against the French in France. Now that potentially could be a conversation on their 28th going, this could be, this could be Scotland all over. They could be on for an absolute mm. grand slam. Well, let's go to England. Look, they came second in every department, but uh, I'll talk about what I think Jones 
needs to do. Let's discuss what went wrong. It's as simple as this. Three first choice props out for various reasons. And it's quite clear that the three who came in can probably do a job on their own when they're partnered with one of the missing players. But when they came into any pairing, they were under pressure in the set and they're not effective ball carriers or as effective as, say, Sinclair and Mako Vinopola. And from the set piece, if you don't get that right, and the line-out wobbled a couple of times when they got into 22, there were occasional visits. They didn't win the right... They didn't win line-out ball, some were scrappy. And it's simple as this. If you don't get that right, you're under pressure in the second phase. They were then static, and everything just knocked on. They then didn't kick well because they were under pressure, and, and so on and so forth. But to me, it started, they couldn't get the right platform. And you're well versed in the areas of set piece, and I'd, I'd never dare go against your word on that. I think what, what look you add to it is not just that set piece element to it, which is significant. It's the multi phase, the kind of continual flow of attack. That's when you start to get to grips with how teams play, their culture, their structure, and, and what they're looking for. It was the 68th minute that England got their most phases when they went into double figures, the first time in the game. Yep. The, the kicking away we know about, but actually more so than that, Scotland got 27 line breaks. England got five. So there is no sense of well, flow of the game. There's no sense of continuity in the attack. And if you are kicking the ball away, I don't have a problem with that. Finn Russell kicked the ball away plenty. He actually, I've got it down here actually, he kicked the ball 17 times, passed it 12. But with that array of kicking style, exactly. it's just so difficult. To a lot play. of them it's were offensive kicks, well. weren't they though? Yeah, and, and you only have to look at the premiership. England teams, England defence, England players do not cope well with that, that style of play. Danny Cipriani carves up for a reason because he's almost painting pictures that these players don't see in trading. It's not something that is run of the mill. So Finn Russell comes in. England hate playing against him because you just have no idea what he's going to do. You, as centres, you can't move forward because you fear the wide kicks. Your wingers have to keep their shape and their depth. And then you get any front five or any low number player bricking it in case you're the guy that makes look like a fool. So it's a really difficult scenario. Finn Russell has one drawn and won against England in his mm. last game. So he's got no fear at all. I mean, when you get to a situation where... And this has been a problem for quite a while. The England ball carrying. First of all, they didn't have the most effective carriers available. That's a reason, not an excuse. But even so, um, even when they have had them, and certainly last Saturday without them, the sophistication which they'd managed to develop going into the World Cup and through the World Cup, in how they varied the point of contact between backs and forwards, what they did just before contact, whether they went in, whether they went out, whether they went around the back, that's just not there. It's very simple, one-out pop. It's, you know, it's very readable. Yeah, not many offloads in the whole game, to be honest. No. And I think the one thing that I'd say that typifies this, and, and we kind of alluded to this before in terms of the games and the style and the amount they've played, that England came into that with just 23 starts um, in their previous two months as a starting team. Yep. And that's where that body hardness can really count because you're getting shots that otherwise you'd ride, you'd carry, you'd offload... You get so used to it. But if you're not playing regularly, it is incredible how quickly you can lose I mean, that, it's difficult to... because I mean, people were saying, you know, you should, I, with a large amount of uh, hindsight, I, I, I might add, saying, why did he pick the Southers players? I tell you what, if they hadn't played, I'm not sure their replacements would have done any better. And what would have been said if, if for example, he hadn't picked Farrell, George, um, Billy Vanapola? who are the three of their most experienced players, but he, he would have got slaughtered for that. He, he, I'm, I'm sure he looked at them in training. I'm sure they looked sharp in training. I'm not so sure there's much he could have done about that because you can't tell you get into game situations. What I do think is this. As you mentioned, mindset, ambition and so on. He needs to pick a young scrum half and a young fly half to add to that squad. Not just be, be, well, because they need new ideas, they need a freshness, you know, uh, um, and daring. And also, you cannot have settled players who believe that they can just carry on playing and will get picked above, you know, barring anything else. They need to know that their place is on the line, no matter who they are. And there's competition. Um, if he doesn't do it now, it'll be too late. And whether it goes right is a risk. But the rewards, as France is seeing, could be substantial. And the French have been building for this for three or four years. And I was looking at the guard, their under-20s campaigns for the World, World Cup uh, under-20s tournaments, and they are just 
building and building and building the, the whole structure around the game of who can play, how you register in terms of your qualification and, and pathways are really gaining momentum. So the French, for me, are looking outstanding. But just a question on that, Brian, because you've been involved in teams that have perhaps stuttered and faltered. Yep. Is it a case of, and it's difficult because they can't make the changes, but is it a case of making the changes or is it a mindset thing? I think it's a, a combination of both things. You see, it goes back to this kicking strategy. As I've mentioned several times, um, and people keep ignoring this, I don't know why, Jones has had this, these games analysed going back decades and is firmly convinced that the teams that kick most, especially off the front foot, um, win more games. And that may well be true, but you've got to kick well. And when people talk about plan B, it's simply this to me. The, it's, the kickers or the decision makers have got to have the humility and honesty to say, I'm not doing it right. Uh, chances are, I'm not going to do it right, and we need to fix this. And be humble enough to say, right, let's change this. And also, they, they have to understand, successive poor kicks are turnovers. It's a turnover. It might be a turnover 20 yards down the field, but you're still giving the ball away. And then when you're on the end, wrong end of a two-thirds, one-third possession stat, you will never get momentum. And England did, just didn't have any. And 15 penalties to throw in the mix there as well. I think that's another Well, four in the first five is... minutes. Not good. Yeah, yeah. hold on. Yeah, um, what, what do you think about the, 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 the half-back selection? I, I, look, Ben Youngs has been a great servant. Will he make the next World Cup? Very unlikely. So, I, I, just, I just... There's a sameness about that. Every, we all know what Ford and Farrell can do. And if he believes that those are the best options, then fine, but how will he know... Unless he tries a Smith or a, you know, a man or, you know, or someone different. But I think we've already seen that window of opportunity go. Mm. And, I, and I think if, if they were going to do that, you'd look at those awesome internationals that were last November where you could really have tried in what was a throwaway tournament yep. to, to get those players in and to, and to mould them. Clearly, he's building to something. And he, he wants a number of caps. He, he's, he mentions it quite often about the experience gained from it. Now, there's a completely different concept of that when you're picking form players because you only have to look at the premiership and the strength of depth that that can provide but England do not have the luxury of centrally contracted players so they have to name this squad at the beginning of the year and now stick with it certainly this yep. bubble so you've got a feel and for remember those it's only on 28 it's not 35 like a lot of the, a lot of the <laughs> yeah. squads yeah um, look Italy are up next do you expect changes if so where um, more importantly do you do you anticipate a change in what we have identified as uh, the mindset? I'm not sure you can make changes. I mean, how do you tell a team that have just probably underperformed more so than they ever had that they don't get a chance to right that wrong? And I think that's one of the conversations they'll be having as a senior leadership group and say, OK, look, stick with us, we'll prove it. Luckily, it's Italy, which is almost a bit of a buy in some situations, certainly the team they're feeling at the moment. I think the week after that would be really interesting how England then go, um, because Wales away... Mm, thanks very much for that after that week off against Italy so I think that's going to be more of an acid test for how things go but I don't doubt that they're going to come back in and depends you know what you're looking for if you're looking for a, a result you're going to get it are you going to get a performance that's the big question against exactly. Italy and how do you even challenge yourself when you know potentially it's a different type of game in terms of intensity well and that's called being professional isn't it yeah exactly Well, you mentioned Wales, and uh, they scraped a win over, well, 14-man island for most of the game. Very welcome win for Wayne Pivak. There were points in that game where I didn't think they were going to do it, but why don't we get the view of an experienced uh, former Ireland international? We'll now speak to Alan Quinlan, former Ireland back row, who's on the line. Brian, how are you doing? It was a brave performance. Uh, going down for 14 men. Andy Farrell said after the game, the game was there for the taking. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think it was there for the taking. I think it, they'll be very disappointed by it. Um, you know, I think it was always going to be a tight game and a difficult game for Ireland. Both sides have their issues and maybe question marks over them. Wales had a dreadful 2020. Ireland didn't have their best either. So, um, you know, but I felt that Ireland were good enough to go there and win. And uh, obviously the the sending off changes the game. I think the response from Ireland after that sending off was was incredible. Um, they played super super rugby, put loads of width in the game. Ninety eight percent success rate at the breakdown. 
an area <clears throat> that I, I would have concerned me before the game with Tipperick, Falatau, Lydias and, and Navidi coming on. But Ireland were really good in that area. So a lot of positives for Ireland. And I thought they... But their game management let them down in the second half. Uh, 17 turnovers and they give away some silly penalties. So, you know yourself, it's hard to keep... keep to get everything right for the full 80 and when you get a performance against the odds I think you have to do that and yeah. unfortunately Ireland couldn't do that they had added to their own downfall at times in the second half and of course the Billy Burns moment to forget missing touch uh, unforgivable on some levels like he, it, it, does, it does happen he just, he, just, he just sliced it didn't he but did you think at a deeper level Ireland have an issue um, with, with Sexton I mean I'm not saying he, it's a difficult choice, isn't it? Is he going to get there for two years' time? Um, he has been prone to head injuries before. Can they do that? Is the succession plan there? What's your view on that difficult decision? Yeah, it is a difficult decision. I think he, he still is the best fly half available to Ireland. I think there's a sizable gap between him and the rest. There is some promise with some good young guys coming through. I think, um, you know, Ross Bourne has got opportunities last year. Not really taking them, not put in performances that have got people excited. He's still a very good footballer and he plays really well for Leinster when he plays. Billy Burns has obviously come into the scene, um, having, you know, signed with Ulster last year and playing particularly well for them. But I think, you know, in an ideal world, Ireland need to produce some, some young fly halves. There is some, uh, there is another Bourne in, in Leinster and it's Harry Bourne, um, and I think this guy has the potential to have the to be the real deal. He's uh, incredibly exciting. He's physical. He's skillful. Has a real um, confidence about him. And you want your fly half to be confident. Um, there's another couple in Munster. Ben Healy has done well for them. Jack Crowley, uh, Jake Flannery. These guys have played Ireland on the 20s and they're just coming through the Munster system now. So um, it's gone on for a number of years, Brian. Um, Sexton has been brilliant and he's a great leader. Um, but I think there's so much pressure on him and the opposition teams know that if they if they rattle him, um, they can stop Ireland a little bit. And, you know, he's got another concussion as well, which he's had many before. So at the moment, um, the players behind are, are not taking the jersey off him. But there is a couple of young players, and I think Harry Barnes, who should be, I think he's more ready than the other guys in Munster. Um, he should be propelled forward and brought in and... You know, you, you you look at Intermac when he when he first got capped for France as an 18 year old. He's probably first 10, 12 games where he was poor for France. He was indecisive. He was didn't do the basics well, and just look where 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 he is now and the confidence he has. So it's all about confidence. But it's a real issue for Ireland because you need you need options off the bench. You need playmakers to come on, and, and if you're struggling a game, it's a position that you need somebody to come into to do something different. And Ireland don't really have that. The other players are very functional, but they're not at the same level as Sexton. Hi, Alan, it's Rob here. Just a quick question, something that was mentioned a lot, certainly also with Farrell's tenure, about Ireland's identity. A lot of people calling for what it is and what it looks like. Do you think they're any further down the line for establishing that? They're a little bit. I think, um, obviously, the identity they had under Joe Schmidt was um, the basics were, were done incredibly well. They were so difficult to take the ball off their breakdown work was, was second to none it was probably up there with the best in the world and um, you know their set piece was solid as well and they were very effective in the type of pressure game they played it, it's become very disjointed you know there's, there's guys there's been a fair number of changes he, he capped 10 players in 2020 he's trying to bring new players in and they're definitely in a, a bit of a uh, rotation process at the moment where in this cycle for the World Cup. We've always been criticised about peaking at the wrong time, i.e. in the middle of World Cups um, and in an ideal scenario, you want to be you know, peaking towards the World Cup. And um, So, yeah, we're not really sure, but I think they've made progress, um, particularly that last game against Scotland in the Autumn Nations Cup. Um, they, did re- they beat a poor Welsh team in round one, lost again to England, and same questions were asked there. We're really poor against Georgia. But the finish against Scotland was, was promising um, with a bit more expansion in their game. And you know yourself, Rob, it's not, you can't just, um, the, if you want to be more expansive in the game, it helps when you have X-factor players and powerful guys and quick guys who can do brilliant things. There's been a lot of the same faces there for a number of years, but um, they're trying to get back to that level and get the basics really right. 
And, you know, with 14 men yesterday, I thought the 20, 25 minutes after Romani was sent off, I thought they were absolutely brilliant and um, in the way they were playing. Their accuracy was so good. So um, we don't know yet um, is the answer. And unfortunately, they've started badly. Um, they've got France next week. So I think we'll be able to judge and answer that question with, in more definite circumstances after the, the Six Nations. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about what you thought of their prospect but can you also um, tell me Paul O'Connell has been added to the backroom setup. you know a tremendously knowledgeable guy what in particular do you think he will be asked to focus on I think Brian he's going to bring more detail and it's it's a difficult one when you're explaining line out to people because it, line out isn't just about the hooker throwing the ball in and somebody jumping in the air and winning it and being you know six foot seven or eight and the taller you are, the better your line-out is. The line-out is all about timing, speed, movement on the ground, and really understanding you're not a caller, but you're somebody involved in a line-out that you know, even before the line-out caller makes the call, you have an idea where he's going to go when you look at the opposition and you see where the opportunity is. Um, so what he will do is he bring a real detail and, ex- and expectancy for everybody involved and in, in in an Irish lineout, that they understand why they're doing the certain lineout, um, where they're doing it, where they're winning it, and that adds to your attack. You know, if your lineout is functional and you can win ball in the middle and towards the tail of the lineout, well then you can get it, take it off the top, and you can attack, and you're on the front foot, and you can give the ball early to your back line, and that's an area that Ireland have struggled. And look, every opposition lineout try and negate. Um, the opposition throw and, and put bodies in the air and Ireland have struggled and they've looked they've looked lack, lacking in a bit of confidence there so I think O'Connell is going to make him more confident make him understand the line out and he was one of the guys who loved the detail of Joe Schmidt around the breakdown why uh, players went in certain ways the angles they went in at um, and you know Joe Schmidt's set piece and attack plays came from really effective rocking and and the way they rocked and stuff. So I think he'll add to that as well. And, and just his overall presence, right? You know, he's a real leader and he's someone who can inspire a lot of these guys who, who look like they're they're flustered in the last year or two. Um, James Ryan is such a wonderful player. Um, he's have to, having to take a lot on his shoulders. And, you know, I think with, with a team struggling a little bit, particularly, you know, France, England are probably a level above the other three teams. Maybe not after the weekend. Scotland has kind of uh, maybe changed that a little bit. But, you know, they're in a level below. And, and you know yourself, it's all about confidence and self-belief. So there's still a lot of questions about Ireland. And it would have been wonderful to see them with 15 players on. And to, to if they didn't win the game, then to really, you know, call for massive change and, and dissect the whole thing. But we can't do that. And it's unfair to do that. I think they showed, if you want to look at it on a positive side yesterday, they showed that they can be very good if they keep everyone fit, there is an over-reliance on the 9 and 10. Um, and they're the kind of areas that they have to improve on. And maybe psychologically, they have to get to the next level where they get their confidence back. And even in tough games, when they're under pressure, that they don't give away silly penalties or make mistakes and errors, which they did in the second half yesterday. You know, they lost control there. And, you know, I, I think a ring rose offload on this 48, 49 minutes, which led to George North's try. He makes a really good carry. He tries an offload. Ireland are 13 6 up. You know, hold on to the ball. Keith Earl's penalty. Um, you know, James Lowe coming in off the wing for the second try. Just small errors and mistakes that really cost you at that level. And I think they need to learn very quickly because. Um, but it is what it is. You know, Ireland, it's not as if they've players missing and they can bring all these guys back and change. You know, most of those guys are the guys he's going to have to use going forward and gradually bring in one or two young players, which he has done. You know, Will Connors has come in. Came off the bench yesterday. He's been brilliant for for Leinster and and done well in in, in November. Caelan Doris, I think he's he's one that can really make a difference for this team with his ball carrying ability. And Stander actually played, you know, in November played better as a six. So um, they need to find a ten. That's the area. And uh, Craig Casey's in the squad, the scrum half. So there is a couple of younger options, but we don't know where these players are at yet. But just a quick one. I guess when you look at games like this with such controversy, 13-minute red card, do they sometimes become a bit too overanalyzed when you say, look, if we had 15 men, different concept, let's just move on and park it? 
Um, yeah, I think I don't think Andy Farrell is going to look at the game and analyse and say, well, we'll free an extra body here, he wouldn't have scored a try, or if we, you know, had an extra body at that breakdown, we would have turned the ball over. I think he's going to look at the mistakes and some of the basic errors in the second half yesterday. They were always Wales were always going to have their moments and and come out firing in the second half. And probably for the first seven or eight minutes of that second half, Ireland did a lot of good things. They forced turnovers. Um, they they put in really good impact tackles. And like I say, Gary Ringrose makes that carry from the scrum. Gets a great little shoulder, seven or eight yards going forward, go to ground, get it back to your, um, you know, or you let Murray thump it down the field and play in the opposition half. And they are little things that just went wrong and, bad reads in the fence and knock-ons and, and turnovers. So that's what he's going to have to focus on. Not, I don't think he's going to stand up, and I think he's a really honest guy. And if I don't think he's going to stand up and say, well, it's not, it's, this has got to do with 14 men, or even in the coaches' meeting, they're going to look at the detail that they need to become more mentally resilient and stronger and, and, and improve their decision-making under pressure, both in defence and attack. So, you know, they are where they are at the moment. I think they're still a decent side. There is... A, positives you can take from it and I still think there'll be a handful for for anyone for the rest of the tournament um, but it's difficult now they've got to pick themselves up for France next week who are you know you talk about confidence and self-belief they're flying high if they get on the front foot they can be incredibly good Gwenny we're going to leave it there mate but thank you very much interest as always take care mate pleasure thanks guys Wales needed that win uh, do you think they've turned the corner I mean I I, I wouldn't read too much into that. Wales could easily have lost that game. They were under a well, lot of yeah. pressure for a long time with Ireland. I think Ireland did tire a bit. Um, but I thought Wales were disjointed, areas rocked, and they, it wasn't a get out of jail. But, you know, with the players available and coming back, uh, I think he was slightly rusty. I don't I say lucky. I mean, they, 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 they put chances away, but I, I think it's too soon before you start making. Any major plus points for, for the world setup at the moment? Yeah, if it weren't for Tipperick's 29th tackle yeah. in the 83rd minute, yes. they'd have lost it against 14 men for 67 minutes of the game. So I, yeah. I can't say you're going to say the turn the corner, but there's so many questions about how Wales are trying to play. They had phase after phase, didn't look like they were that threatening occasionally. And I, I think there's you know a lot of stuff still to go in, in the PVAC tenure where he's trying to make them play like Scarlett's did. I'm not sure that's possible at Test Rugby. Well, Italy, um, 50 points to 10 defeat against France, 28th consecutive loss. Sam Warburton was talking about the need for promotion and relegation of Six Nations. This is a, a subject we've covered before. Um, we'll cover it again. Um, George say that they are currently kept by a glass ceiling. Look, I, 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 I've always said it is absolutely essential that the second-tier nations, both in the northern and the southern hemisphere, get an automatic right to play in the big competition in their hemisphere. I don't think it should be promotion and relegation every year because I think that's far too... It just doesn't give teams the opportunity to grow. I don't care whether it's every two years, every three years, home and away, first years, whatever it is, but there's got to be something. I would just add this, though. Georgia are no better than Italy. We saw them in the Autumn Nations Cup. They are no better than Italy, and... They are actually, I believe, where Italy were many years ago, where they are very good at the things you can learn off route, the set drills, but their fluency in open play isn't there. Um, and I think it's a like-for-like -like thing. I, I mean, you can't continue with Italy time immemorial. I'm not sure at the moment, though. Um, Georgia would be much of an improvement, but the point for me is giving the opportunity for teams to become self-sufficient by getting into the top table. So I look at this a bit more holistically and having been out in Tbilisi again for the 2020 Championship, I think it was three years ago, uh, 28 days in their capital. What an amazing place. They absolutely love their rugby. Yet the thing they don't have is, as you say, a seat at the table. So I think Italy have been around long enough to grow the game, not to perform at the top level, but to grow the game. And it hasn't happened. Yeah. At no level are Italy competitive in men's, women's, whatever, sevens, fifteens. So for me, they've had their chance and opportunity. And I agree, relegation wouldn't help. And having been subject to a few relegations myself uh, with Leeds and, and a bit of a scare at Newcastle, 
you're just going to get yo-yoing teams. You don't want that. You want to say a ring fence, a five-year programme where they can say, come yep. in and have a crack. Because the thing that happens in Georgian rugby is they get pickpocketed by the French. Whereas if you actually have a top tier competition where they can play their club rugby domestically or even perhaps around Europe but come back to the spearhead of this championship, then you're going to grow the game. They want to grow the game. They've got the infrastructure. And I tell you what, I've not been in as good an atmosphere in and around Europe as it was in Tbilisi. It was mental. It was like watching Argentina in the crowd. They were just <laughs> crazy for 80 minutes. Well, briefly, um, because time is running on, on France, heavy favourites, well, certainly with the bookies to lift the Six Nations, play with a lot of confidence. Antoine Dupont is probably performing as well, if not better than any player in the world at the moment. He's a linchpin of lots of things. Do you see any superficiality in these performances or do you think they are well grounded and solid? I think they're solid. The thing that scares me a bit with this French team and how they're played at the moment is if you were to pick one team that perhaps wouldn't go that well in an empty stadium, it would be the French. <laughs> and yet they're absolutely tearing up. So the, the concept of them playing at home, I know we talk about 2023 is the big thing on the horizon, but the more they get used to these environments where there is little pressure um, and perform really well, that that sends a little bit of a shiver down my spine because they've got the strength, they've got the depth, they've got the quality, they've got the X factor, they've got a little Fijian thrown in there occasionally as well, which is always quite not helpful. That little. <laughs> not that little. Not little. No, that's right. And they've got and Teddy so Toma, who's outrageous. Country. Yeah, and I just want to see him try a bit more. I remember Ben Kayser saying he is the best athlete he's ever come across, but never, ever breaks more than 85% pace. Just want to see him, just one game, just go mental and go for it. Well, let's, the secret to this, the, this is not a secret, it's just sense. They've now got a selection panel and a coaching panel that haven't gone crazy. You know, all their previous uh, selectors and coaches, whatever they did that was sensible at a club level, when they got to the national level, they just became, they just became <laughs> haphazard and, and sort of contrary. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite simple picking the best players on form consistently giving them the chance and giving them direction it's as simple as that with France and it's amazing they haven't done, you know they've now got the performance they've got the uh, talent it's been coming through the under 20s um, you know and I do believe they, they will continue to but that's great because you know we need uh, a strong France both for this tournament and to add an extra challenge for the World Cup You have um, been asked to be on a disciplinary panel for the Six Nations. How do you get, what's that gig? What do you, what, what will you actually do? Oh, a bit of green envy coming through from, from Mr. Law himself. Uh, no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really clever idea for me, actually. They're trying to canvas ex-players, and I guess to agree, people in, in the media, to try and give more of a all-rounded view. Yep. And what's really intriguing is I've only actually sat on two hearings, and the coaches are adamant to get the opinion of the ex-player. Um, just because it gives a slightly different wording, framework, perhaps less legal. And you know how formal the yeah, yeah. location process can be. So I think it's a really good idea. David Barnes spearheading it, the RFU initially, and then from there on the World Rugby panel as well. So just intriguing to hear these conversations. And uh, uh, for me, commendable to think about how significantly experienced these people are on the panel that give up their time all voluntary um, and, and really do shape the game. So they get hammered for it. Yeah. And I don't think that's fair. And the reason why it's not fair is because they're not allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And if, if they were, it would blow people's minds. Well, um, uh, we look forward to be able to hammer you then. That's all right. That's fine. Last week, we spoke to Simon Middleton, the coach of the England women team, the Roses, and the future of the women's Six Nations now being resolved. A new reduced format over four weeks in April, split into two pools, similar to the Ocean Nations Cup. What do you think of the standalone idea? Because it is a well-trodden path to have umbrella tournaments <clears throat> like the Paralympics alongside the Olympics to, to, to get sponsorship, to get crowds, to keep the momentum. It's a challenge and an opportunity for the women's game. It's a massive opportunity. And I've been in many conversations with many of the women's, both in 7s and 15s, where they believe they're at a point now where they want to look at standalone and, and go their own way. The thing that probably shocks me a little bit is that they still don't have a title sponsor. Well, right. if you think about the return on investment you're going to get for that, if people are perhaps affluent business people on this on this podcast listening, then then that is bang for your buck. 
because you're going to get as, as much exposure as you can dream of for very little price at the moment. Yep. And that's only going to go one way. It's going to get more and more expensive. So lock in a 10-year deal as you can. For them, it's a great opportunity. It's still going to come down to England playing France, and I think they know that. But it's a really good way of growing the game. And I could not think of a better time to do that than now because the noise and volume around the women's game is as good as it's ever been. Some fan questions. First from Daniel Burgess. Do you think Jones, that's Eddie Jones, obviously, was right to complain England only had 30% possession, therefore that's where their attack didn't do anything. But it was evident that their game plan was to kick away possession from 9 and 10 as often as possible, thus losing possession by design. Well, we've partially answered this. One of the reasons is they've looked at the stats and so on. It's, it's like this, Daniel. If you don't do it right, nothing's going to work, and they've not been doing it right far too often recently. Uh, it's not just the kick, it's the chase as well. Um, it's a, but but also this, even if that tactic is germane in a game in which it is even, when you are under pressure because you've not got the ball, you have to look at whether that strategy is going to work as against gaining your momentum. And also this, if you kick the ball a long way down the field, it's only partially useful if you can't put the opposition under sufficient pressure at the subsequent line-out or at their exit strategy, because it just comes back at you. And if, as happened last Saturday, the kick-per-kick kick duel is being returned with the cliché of interest, Hogg and others, then you've got to stop doing it, because you're not winning. And this is the point for me. It has to be looked at, and it can't be the sacred cow, because it doesn't apply uh, in circumstances which uh, are adverse. One for you, Rob. Why didn't England have a plan B? Repeatedly pinged off start, especially when refs are facing the obsession about pinging at scrums. I think the, the point about the plan B is they didn't get enough time and opportunity to execute their plan A well enough because of that kick in. And the one example I can give you, and this I actually paused the TV because I couldn't believe what I saw. It was a right-hand side to left-hand side movement. Farrell got the ball. It was a seven-on-three overlap. Yes, yes. He put the ball on his left foot as a right-footed player like, to, to kick that ball that poorly. But what was more staggering on it is that the Scotland line, defensively, only had two players in the backfield. Mm. One was central. The other one was Stuart Hogg on the right. It went straight to him. And that's where you start thinking about, OK, you've not had the ball much at all. said before about their possession stats were abhorrent. But then to kick the ball under pressure shows what their default is. Yeah, and, and, no, but, and not to recognise you've got a seven to three. Yeah, and it happens quite a lot. It, it happened throughout the autumn that Dana gets the ball with Johnny May on his left, and rather than giving him the winger the ball with twenty metres space with a one on one, kicks it long, and it was an alright outcome because you get the line out back in their territory. But it shows what that default consideration yeah. is, and it, for me, that's where it becomes dangerous because rugby is all about scanning and seeing snapshots and making decisions. And that comes back to the, the right point I, I was making about potential changes at halfback to try and break that up, to have people whose natural... Uh, either... I mean, Ford's natural game used to be playing flat, didn't it? I mean, he, the, the, that's what he was very good at. He was less good. Flat by his skill level, yeah, because yeah. his passing game is one of the best on the planet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah James, agree. why does Eddie Jones continue picking Eddie Dill? He's obviously scared under the high ball, cost him the World Cup final, a bit harsh. 80 months old, still costing him. Mike Brown is still available, probably better. Um, just about my turn. I, I think uh, Daly brings a lot to the team. He brings pace. He's kicking. He's prodigious. I just don't think he's as good a fullback when uh, compared to a winger as Watson. If you just swap them over, I think you'd get more, even without making you know any personnel changes from the team. I just think the positioning is wrong. Well, I don't even think he's a winger. I think he's a 13. And having played against him and seen his progression as a 13, I was thinking, who the hell is this guy? With that boot, with that pace, that outside line, you know, he's got the attributes to be so influential. And what you get when you look at Eddie Jones' selection is he wants versatility. He's citing in the pre-game talk, it's not an inside and outside centre. It's a centre and they're quite interchangeable. So he just wants players who are versatile. I think Alec Dale is one of the best performers in the country. But what I would say is he's not playing with the confidence that we saw three, four years ago. And that's where coaching definitely has an impact. David Carroll, how many Scotland players do you think can make the Lions the hoary old subject? Well, you'll have to wait and see, David, because tell you what, <laughs> after one game, you can't judge. You seriously can't judge. All I would say is a lot of them advanced their cases and England players didn't at all. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if again, they didn't get as many as they think they should do, simply because on the one-off criteria, Ben, you're judging out of, out of the four teams, they might still get caught short, which would be a shame. But having said that, what if they... What if they end up grand slamming? What if they win the title? Then, of course, it's going to be a big difference. Final one for you. Toby Bradley Watson. With Ireland winning almost... Well, with Ireland almost winning with 14 men and most of the possession, uh, Scotland also controlling the possession, are we seeing a trend for position becoming more critical over territory? I think he means possession. Possession. Someone's yeah. spelled this wrong. It's our producer. We'll fire him. It's all right. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> Move towards possession. I think possession is an interesting facet because all you do with possession really is try to build pos- uh, pressure, which territorially, if you're playing in their third, as you saw with Ireland's tactic to get the line-up ball off the Welsh, it works well. I, I don't always necessarily think trends are seen like that. And Eddie Jones has been quite vocal in the fact that he thinks that k- teams that kick the ball more win more statistically. So I don't think there's a general shift towards that, not really. Well, that's all we have time for this week on Brian Moore's Full Contact with The Telegraph. Six Nations, I told you, It's never dull. It might not be the best quality rugby absolute in the world. In fact, it doesn't often reach those heights, but you can never take it for granted. And we have now got a situation where everything is thoroughly thrown into the mix. When we come back, will England have bounced back against Italy? Well, they'll win because they've never lost. But will the performance be good enough? And what will Eddie Jones do? He's got limited options, as Rob rightly pointed out, because of the way in which these squads have been picked and the... Uh, non-century contracted players can uh, Wales continue uh, and will France just march over everybody join us next week huge thank you to my co-host Rob Vickerman and to Alan Quinlan for joining me if you enjoyed this episode why not subscribe and check out some of the previous episodes and to stay up to date on all things sport head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash contact where you can get 30 days access to all the Telegraph's premium sports coverage completely free which will include my column Goodbye.